As the knife is made to cut, I can be nothing less than I am, and so I will be honest. I have no memory, and I am always running away. Even after rain, when my skin is glass, and I reflect back everything you say, already a dam is opening upstream to wash you away. You know this. As you must know that in me, eyeless, limivorous fishes dig food from the muck among rotting suicides. That every flood has me spilling sewage and gore over my banks. And still, there you are among sycamores or waving from bridges. Like a fool, you carry me with you in the volume of your skin like a photo. Green veins tattoo a map of me over your wrists. You must know that if I love you back, it will be at 60,000 cubic feet per second. This is not meander, not the slow lave of an oxbow. This is arc and animals scrambling for high ground, eyes rolling. Below the surface, my current gathers itself into what I really am, amnesiac, unmerciful. I will sweep you away. And when you are gone, in relentless grief, I will flood my banks to touch the earth where you stood and wash them down to bedrock. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> This one's been called Before You Wake, and it's also upsetting. <laughs> this is actually the first love poem, like something that I would call a love poem, that I ever wrote. And um, it started when I was looking through um, pictures that they used to do in like Dutch genre painting where they would show like a flayed carcass as like an anatomical study. Before you wake. It's hard to look all at once. If I do, I see an anatomy lesson, the horrors of the body as meat. Your chest a gaunt scaffold limbed in skin, pale as a peeled carcass hooked in the butcher's window every tendon and bone visible, your fingers an asphyxiated blue dangling from the bed, your eyes rolled into your skull, your skull welling up through your face. You do not move as I follow a translucent spider work of veins to your sternum, press my ear to that closed door and listen. Your infallible body makes the same predictions over and over in the sluggish morse of blood. These sheets are the butcher's apron, each morning a whetstone against which the days are ground, knife thin, their edges so sharp they could cut you from your skin. So I'm going to move on to some newer stuff. Um, and this has the potential to go badly, so <laughs> I feel like that's a good way to start a performance. <laughs> um, well, let's see how this goes. This one's called Party Foul. Last weekend, my sister dragged me to a dark corner of the party and threw her drink in my face. You're furious, she said. Apparently, anger was rolling off my body like waves of heat from a smelting furnace, and three people who had been standing behind me in line at the bar started coughing, said they smelled something odd, a singeing melt of lace and polyester and sequins, and they looked down to find their clothes smoldering on their bodies where they stood. One of them had third-degree burns, at least, and another guest was taking him to the emergency room. That's what my sister said. Anyway, dabbing at, the sh at my shirt with a cocktail napkin, even though the mess had mostly evaporated by then. Oh, I said. She tried to pry the gnarled black coal of a heart from my sleeve. Can you get your voice to stop sounding like that? I slapped her hand away. Like what? 
Like crackling flames, everyone will know it was you. Can you hide this thing? It's unsightly and possibly dangerous. She made a sharp, exasperated gesture toward the heart, which cracked along the seams and beat once, seeping black fluid. I said nothing. I stared at the floor, afraid to look anywhere or speak a word. Three people? What would be left behind, I wondered, if my body boiled off in a wicked witch, melting, melting, melting. A steaming black hat of hair, keratin and calcium, a hot slag of copper and iron where my blood used to be, bones and teeth, weaponry. Your hair, my sister whispered then, it's starting to smoke. These are all part of this weird series that kind of happened. So this one's called <laughs> The Poet's Mother on Beauty and Etiquette, which started with a list of things my mom used to say to us. Um, and then spiraled out from there. <laughs> <laughs> the poet's mother on beauty and etiquette. It's called a chignon, and yes, the pins need to stab into your scalp like that, or else it might fall out. Being pretty hurts. Get used to it. Now listen. When you meet so-and-so, the so-and-so who works in finance and likes mountain bikes, dark hair, ironed Oxford, nice shoes, ne nephew to that other so-and-so, you know the one. Do not say, I work all day to say one thing I actually mean and hardly ever succeed. No one knows what you're talking about. <laughs> Do not say, I like the way your wrists disappear into buttoned cuffs, like you might be hiding bracelets of bruises. Why do you say stuff like that? For the love of God, just shake hands, smile, say something nice about being very pleased to meet whoever anyone is. Hold still. Do not touch your face. Do not touch your hair. Do not smile too big. You'll get lipstick on your teeth and it looks alarmingly like blood, that shade you like so much. Will you not even consider this nice shell pink? Do not eat or drink without first peeling your lips back from your mouth for similar reasons. Do not do that thing you do, that unblinking stare thing, eye contact for three seconds at a time, then look away. Do not say what you're thinking, because I know how your brain works, and what you're thinking is, at best, disquieting. <laughs> Do not grip his hand after you shake like it's a rope dropped down a dark well. No matter how you feel, do not trace the veins on his wrists with your fingertips. Remember to blink. Remember to breathe. Remember not to run your tongue over your teeth like you can't wait to eat. Ladies, You should really know this by now. Wait, here's a towel to wipe that trickle of blood from your nape. I shouldn't have to tell you. I think you're ready now. If you don't move, you look just beautiful. <laughs> Um, I started, after my sister um, got married, I started writing all these epithalamiums, which is just a big fancy Greek word for poem to celebrate a wedding. Um, and I had to look it up too. Um, but they were all about disasters and like terrible matches, like horrible things. Um, and I don't really know, but I think I was kind of exploring like what it would take to make an irrevocable choice like that. Um, and the way my brain works, I just sort of go to the disastrous. So this one is called Epithalamium Necrophilia. <laughs> and 10 points, and possibly a signed free book to anyone who can figure out the movie that spawned this one. You say, be very still. And so I sink into a tub full of ice 
and learn to breathe through my skin like a reptile. If I were dead, would you touch me the way I want to be touched? Imagine the pleated sweep of a sheet is a metal slab, the floor a draining board, sloped concrete the color of dirty ice. The hose to shear away a lacquer of blood and the hose to draw it from me like a straw, a soaked towel to swab me down. I have ached for the slow ritual of stripping, imagined you, one hand cradling my lolling head, the other peeling the cut shirt from my shoulders. How close my frost rind lips come to your collarbone then, but no closer. How stark my body, the blush siphoned skin, fish pale and shining. The ice cubes hiss and crack like knuckles, like teeth. Soon, soon they'll stop melting against my skin and I'll go boneless, unblinking, as if stunned by the shock of your touch, as if I cannot bear to look away when you bend over me. Put your lips to the cold volume of my ear and whisper how you want me dead, kin to always. Don't move, you'll say. Be very still. Sweet dreams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this one's called Spider Baby. At first, I wondered how I was going to stop myself from dashing her brains out on the floor, let alone how I would love her. In the gore-spattered hell of the delivery room, we counted ten fingers, ten toes, ten legs. My scary baby was calcium white and horrific beneath the fluorescent lamps, her smooth tummy conjoined with the abdomen of something chitin black and arachnid, a recluse the size of a dinner plate where her navel should be. When the nurse took her away, the spider wrapped its jointed legs around the baby's chest as though she were a sparrow, paralyzed and ready to be swaddled in silk for later. The spider clicked and crouched as the nurse weighed them, swabbed them down. My husband held my clammy hands and kissed my forehead like this was normal. When I looked at him, he smiled hugely. His teeth were sharp, and his eyes weren't just long-lashed and dark, but hungry and hollow, entirely black, as though the pupils had swallowed the whites. They brought us our daughter wrapped in a neat origami of blankets that wove around her spider twin, and I knew that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. We were monstrous. His body, my love. We had only rearranged what we were into a new monster, and I already loved her. I held her close and listened to the sweet, chthonic sounds she made while nursing, watched her spider's hundred eyes glittering up at me, just like her father's. I never even flinched when she reached up to touch my cheek and raked her tiny nails down my face. Okay, so this is the last one I'll read. It's longer, and this is the first time I'm reading it. It's another one of those epithalamiums, and this one is, is less a weird proclivities epithalamium and um, more of a disaster epithalamium. <laughs> so, this one involves a volcano. Um, it's called Epithalamium August 24th, Eric Alano. We go to the boats. Each dark bay along the beach is a brick-lipped mouth cut into the cliffside, the boats like teeth. All day the streets shook and groaned, 
and a towering stone pine rose from the mountain. Like creatures stunned by sound after a thousand years silence, we went still and listened to the rain of pumice hissing down tiled roofs. Now we go to the boats, the muffled slap of our feet on ash-powdered cobbles and the ragged way we gasp the charred air through damp wool loud in our ears. We knew only the sweetness of honey. We had beautiful teeth. In 2,000 years, they will gleam up through wet black ash as a woman with a soft brush unearths us. Our bones will be our names. I will be slave, what's left of me ridged by fevers, starvation, beatings, and the warping tendon strain of labor. The one I lie with will be centurion or senator. He was tall and his bones sing a litany of plenty. The beaten metal clasp sunk in mud at his shoulder. Fibula says he died wrapped in fine boiled wool. What our bones do not say, I did too. He flung his cloak around me and I breathed through the fabric as we ran to the boats. But when we stumbled onto the beach, the bays gaped and howled, housed only darkness and cut ropes. Far out, the waves tossed spit mouthfuls of teeth, all those who fled first, their boats pitching, filling slowly with ash. We knew no one was coming back for us. There's nothing else to prove what we were to each other, huddled in those bays. The bones say he might have owned me, might have brought a hand down hard enough for my teeth to be knocked loose by a sigil ring. Or it might have been like this. We never met before our flight to the boats, before death came for us on a suffocating wave of mud. But when my eyes wept blood, he raised a hand to my face and wiped it away. The gold chill of his rings on my skin was the last thing I felt. Cataclysm is a lens, its focus a luxury soft as ash. Who walks the cobbled sidewalk with you? The outline of your body is a hole punched in the August air, thick as hot mud, no different from the hollows our vaporized remains left in the pyroclastic flow. The ground is still, the day flawless and blue. But if the bricks buckled beneath your feet, if the sky rained a hail of teeth, could you reach for him? If your mouth gulped for air like a hooked fish, what words would escape your lips? To the bones. To the bones. That's all I got. So.